here you're supposed to wear a tie today? I am so embarrassed. Um, it's great to be here. This is the first time I've been on the UVU campus. So uh, I started somewhere in American Fork and walked to uh, Orem, I think, in order to get here. <laughs> but it's a, it's, a big, it's a big campus, it really is. But uh, it's really a treat to be here with you. Tom, I appreciate your invitation to be here. And, and Brad, thank you for that uh, introduction. Um, I would rather have this be a conversation than a uh, lecture. Uh, but uh, I'll talk, but I'll hope you'll also uh, talk and feel free to ask questions and uh, that kind of thing as we go along. Uh, Tom had sent me a little note uh, saying what typically happens in these uh, sessions, and so I'm going to try and be true to that whole thing. Uh, they asked me if uh, I wanted to do a PowerPoint presentation, and I said that if I had to sit through another PowerPoint presentation, I would die. Everybody has, you have in your body, you have a fixed number of PowerPoint presentations that you can sit through. And when you reach your last one, you, you die. And, but nobody actually knows how many you have left. There's not a gate or a meter or anything like that. And so I didn't want anybody here dying on me today. And so uh, I'm not going to do that. So what I thought I might talk about are uh, decisions that you all uh, uh, you know, will potentially make over the next four or five years that are so critical to how things end up working out for you personally. And uh, it's sort of a little bit unfair that when you get to be my age and uh, you're not really not able to do as many things as you can do when you're younger, you can look back and see all of these uh, kind of critical crossroads in your life that made a difference one way or the other. And when you're your age, uh, you have all the ability to, to make all of those decisions and you haven't had quite the same experience. And these may or may not be the right same things for you as they happen to be for me. Uh, and so please take all of that with a grain of salt. These are just uh, things that happened in my life that, uh, that I think ended up being important decisions one way or the other. So let me start with my first decision. And uh, you're, you're already well on your way of doing the right thing on the first decision. So the first decision is make sure you get the best education you can possibly get to succeed. And uh, let me give you just a little bit of context for this. So uh, uh, I, I went to BYU, as, as Brad had uh, mentioned, and uh, uh, I was sort of uh, getting close to graduating. I had uh, tried to focus as much time and effort as I could on classes. Uh, I was working full time, uh, but I tried to get through as fast as I could because I didn't have very much money. And every semester that went by that I was not able to work was, uh, was a, a, a tough one. And so anyway, I, was, I, I had this strategy course. Do, do you take a strategy course here in the business school? How many of you are business school students, by the way? OK, the vast majority here are. So there was a strategy course near the end of business school. So it's sort of to, to be sort of like the capstone of what you would do. And the professor at the time was a professor by the name of Lambert. He was a very good man. I have no idea if he's still alive or uh, he would now you know, be uh, fairly far along in years. But he was a wonderful guy, great professor. And, uh, and it was sort of a, a strategy course. I didn't know much what strategy actually meant at the time. And, uh, and we, uh, uh, we took blue book tests. I, I'm sure you don't take blue book tests anymore, right? You'd probably do the, everything on computer and that kind of thing. But it was a blue book test where you would, it was all kind of, you'd write what you think the, uh, the answers are to the questions that you're being asked. And it's kind of in an essay format. And you had like two hours to finish the exam and that kind of thing. And typically, the professor would sit at the front of the classroom, and he would read while the rest of us would be writing in our blue books. And then you'd just come up and toss your blue book on the pile. And so I finished mine. There was probably still 10 minutes to go or something like that. And, uh, and he stepped out in the hall with me, and we just had a little chit chat. And he said, so what are you planning on doing when you graduate? And I said, uh, well, I think, I think I'm going to go get an MBA. I think I'm going to go to graduate school. And he said, that'd be great. He said, I think that's really a terrific idea. He said, where are you planning on going? And I said, well, I, I don't know. I, 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 I've applied at Harvard and Stanford, and I'm, so, I'm hoping that I might get into one of those places. And he looked at me for a minute, and he said, do you know, if I were you, I would probably broaden my search a little bit, <laughs> indicating just how much confidence he had in me, having just taught me in this strategy course. But. Uh, as, uh, as luck would have it, I took, uh, uh, you know, you have to take the GMAT. I assume you all take the GMAT now still as well. I took the GMAT, and wonder of wonders, I did OK on the GMAT. And uh, so I applied, and I ended up getting into both schools. I'm sure that was a shock for him that uh, that actually happened. 
And I decided to go to Harvard uh, in large measure because I'd never been there. And so I didn't even actually know where the campus was located. So I knew it was in a town called Cambridge, but I wasn't sure if it was like Cambridge, Massachusetts or Cambridge, Pennsylvania. I just knew it was somewhere in the northeastern part of the United States. Um, but, the, but the benefit of having made that decision uh, and everything that goes along with that, the hours that have to be worked in order to pay to finance school, and, uh, and my wife had to, my wife actually uh, typed uh, uh, medical transcription. We already had a baby by the time we got to graduate school, and so she, she worked every day when the baby was asleep and typed medical transcriptions for Brigham and Women's Hospital so that she could earn some money while I was going to school. And it was, it was a, it's a big commitment, obviously, to try and finance something uh, like that. But while I was there, I met some really wonderful people in and around the school that ended up being lifelong friends. Uh, names of people that you would, uh, you know, that you may have come across or, or would know well. Uh, uh, Meg Whitman, uh, who runs HP today and runs Hewlett Packard, was uh, a person that was in one of my uh, sections there. It's when I first met Dave Checkets, who has become a, li a lifelong friend of mine, one of the best friends I have in uh, life. Uh, Kevin Rollins uh, was in Boston at that, that same time, who ended up becoming the CEO of Dell Computer. There's, there's, by, by going and trying to do as best as you can to get an education, it, it, you end up actually being in a place with people that eventually end up in important uh, responsibilities. And so as you sort of think about your education, uh, focusing on getting the best education you can possibly get, really demanding courses and demanding education, and put yourself through as much effort as you possibly can so that you walk away with the uh, perspective that those courses uh, bring to you. So. Uh, Second thing on my list in terms of important decisions, uh, and uh, this might sound uh, a little bit funny, uh, particularly coming from me, but, uh, and that is, as you think about your career and the things that you will do post your uh, education, I think one of the most important things you can do is make a decision to take risk. And, uh, and it, you know, it should be careful risk and calculated <laughs> risk, but a decision to actually take risk in the things that you do. And, uh, and, and here's the reason why. Um, if, you, if you take a job uh, where you are uh, employed by someone and you're working you know, on their payroll, uh, if you've got a good education, you've had a lot of experience, the probability is you're going to do well. Uh, you'll be able to provide for your family. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. It's absolutely OK. But it turns out that the way our system works, the economy in which we all operate, by taking risk, you have the opportunity to earn outsized rewards that far kind of offset what you could make. on an, So even if you have a great job, you're working for an investment bank or a consulting firm or one of these higher paid jobs, at the end of the day, you're still trading your time for money. And there's only so many hours, last time I checked, in a day. There's only so many hours that you can work. And so you can decide to work hard and you know, put your heart into it. But it is hard to create uh, true economic value for yourself, your family, the charities that you care about, the things that are important to you in your life. It's really, really hard to, to make that happen. And let me just give you one example from my son. I, I hope I won't embarrass him by using this example. So my son graduated from BYU in construction management. I don't know if you know anything about that program. It's a super hard program. So you actually have to be, you don't, not only have to kind of graduate in the program itself and do all the schoolwork associated with it, but you have to get a technical capability while you go through. And so he decided to become a general contractor while he was there, so he had to become a framing contractor and have, have all of these years of experience to become a general contractor. And he was graduating in 2006. And he and his buddy uh, said, well, you know, Arizona's been growing really well. Why don't we move to Arizona and we'll start a construction business together in Arizona? So think about this, Arizona 2006. As you might guess, that wasn't the best time to start a construction business in Arizona. But they went down, and his buddy's father was a developer, and he uh, you know, helped them to get their first project. It was a townhouse development that they did, that they built while they were there. And he did several other significant projects uh, over the next four or five years while he was in, uh, while he was in Arizona. 
uh, and after these four or five years, I'd call him on the phone and say, so how are things, because I knew he was working like crazy hours, working like that, how are things going? He said, man, I'm just, I'm working like crazy and I have nothing to show for it, you know? I build these houses, I make just enough money to, you know, pay off the receivables that I got, I'm sort of trading, trading money because it's a, a difficult thing to do. Now here's the interesting point. They moved to Arizona, as I said, in 2006. In 2007, the world fell apart in the housing industry, particularly in Arizona. And they had rented a house when they first moved down there, and they decided that they wanted to build a house uh, when they, uh, or they wanted to buy a house when, uh, you know, as the financial crisis kind of set in, because the prices on houses had come down so long. So let me do some math for you on, on what he did. So he, he bought a home, I think it was about 1,500 square feet, something like that. And I think they paid, no, it's 2,000 square feet, and they paid $75 a square foot. And so the total cost to buy the house is the, you know, 2,000 square feet times the $75, so $150,000. He's now there for four or five years, and they decide they're going to move up here, and he's going to do some uh, development work up here. And so it comes time to sell their house. Well, they've been sitting in their house for that time period with their down payment. They did a normal down payment, so 20% times $150,000, so they made a 30% down payment. Well, it turns out in the time period they were, they were there, housing prices appreciated from $75 a square foot to uh, $100 a square foot. So they were able to sell their 2,000 square foot house for 200,000 times $100 a square foot or $200,000. Now here's the question, what return on that $30,000 of investment did they make in that four year time period? Anybody dare hazard a guess? Yes. 50,000, you get the award for the day. So thank you, 50,000. So they, they, so they made the difference between 150 and 200,000. And how much was his equity investment in the house? Remember, $30,000. So he made 50 on 30, and his buddy was a real estate agent, so he didn't have to pay a commission. He made 30 on 50, and so he made whatever that is, 160% return on the investment that he made because his house was working for him while he was sleeping. And that basic concept is the way economic value gets created in our economy. You take a risk, you commit to buy some sort of an asset of some sort, and it doesn't really matter what it is. It could be stocks and bonds, or it could be if you think there's a commercial project that you can come in and fix and make better, or you could be in the business that I am, and you could buy a company that you think you can make better in some way because of the time and effort that you put behind it. But the wonderful thing about our economy is that creativity matched together with uh, capital, when you add those two things together and you work really hard to make it better, you can generally turn around, if you've done a good job, you can generally turn around and sell it for far more money than you can make if you're just out there working away every day in your job. So his experience in Phoenix actually ended up being a great experience, not because <laughs> for four years he was building houses down there, but because uh, he really did uh, have this opportunity to make some money because he bought that house at a time that it was valued less and he worked on the house to fix it up and, and that kind of thing. So decide now to take prudent risk and own assets, owning assets. And like I say, it doesn't matter. Whatever you happen to be good at, if you know something about a company, then go into that business. If you know something about uh, real estate, do real estate. If you know something about trading stocks and bonds, trade stocks and bonds, you know, whatever it happens to be. I wish when I had been in school, by the way, that I had understood what a trader was. You know, I thought a trader was somebody that was a traitor. I didn't know they were actually traders. Turns out there's these guys, you know, who spend their whole life on Wall Street and all they really do is they buy something at one price and sell it at a different price and they use some amount of leverage to make that happen. It's like being a bus driver. You don't have any work to do at night when you go home. You just go in when the market's open. You go home when the, when the market closes. But if you're great at it and you know what to do, how to do it, uh, then you can, you can do very well. And that's, a, that's another business where you're taking risk and owning an asset. And that's really how our economy works, is based on that general principle of how you own uh, a particular, uh, particular asset. So that's decision number two. 
Let me go to decision number three. So this one starts with, uh, Brad mentioned that I went to, I worked at Bain and Company. I was at Bain for uh, almost 12 years. It was a really great experience. And when I joined Bain, it's, it's sort of funny now in retrospect. I went to a, uh, it must have been a 30 year reunion of Bain, uh, you know, a few years back. And uh, there's now 600 partners in Bain, 600 partners. When I went there, there were 75 employees. And it seemed to me like it was, you know, a real substantial company. When I look back on it, I think, oh my gosh, that was really a crazy risk to take at the time of, uh, of joining that. But anyway, it was a relatively small company of 75 people. And our offices were located in uh, Faneuil Hall Marketplace in Boston. Any of you who know Boston well would know Faneuil Hall. And uh, the, the way I got a job there is a good buddy of mine, a guy named Daryl Rigby, had, uh, had uh, been there the summer before me. And he and I had had a very similar profile when we were at BYU. And he had done a really great job for Bain the year before. So they thought I was like him. I was as capable as he was, which is not true. I was as capable as, so I got the job because of Daryl, basically. And people thinking that Daryl was a really talented and, and capable guy. And uh, um, uh, Mitt Romney, a name that you all know, had joined Bain. He'd been at BCG for a little while after graduating from Harvard. And Mitt Romney had joined there and, uh, and uh, was you know, working there when I showed up. So on one of the first two or three days that I'm there, uh, Mitt Romney, and I'm, this is going to lead back to this decision, Mitt Romney comes in to my office. And he's sitting across the first time I've really ever had much of a conversation with him. He's like the most handsome guy that I've ever seen, right? I'm just, this guy is unbelievable, you know? If I ever could dress like that, look like that, that'd be amazing. So anyway, so Mitt comes in, sits in my office. He says, look, there's one very important. He says, you're, you're LDS, right? I said, yeah, I am. He said, well, I am LDS too. And he said, I just want you to know this. Um, I have got everybody here convinced that LDS people go home at like midnight on Saturday and they don't come back into the office until midnight on Sunday. He said it's sort of like the Jewish thing, you know, where people leave on Friday night before sundown and they don't come back until Saturday night. He says, I think they all believe that about me. And he said, you can't foul this up. So whatever you do, whatever you do, I want to make sure that everybody thinks you have this boundary around what you do. And uh, of course, I was more than happy to take up, that, uh, take up that opportunity to not work. And there were many times over that time period when I went home at midnight and came back Sunday night at uh, midnight, along with Daryl and a few uh, others who were in that uh, situation. But the broader point of that story about uh, Mitt in my office is that I have never worked in a company where somebody said to me, do you know what? You're just, you're just working too hard. We'd really like to see you go home at 3 o'clock this afternoon. You know, just take off and go home, enjoy time with your kids or whatever. That has just never happened to me. Uh, and what has been far more the case is that I've had a pile of work to do like this and a pile of time like that. And figuring out how I get this done with that much time is always a real struggle. And I have realized over time that nobody was going to set boundaries for me in terms of how much I was going to work, that I would personally have to be the one that would actually set those boundaries uh, for what I would do. And, uh, and, and over time, I have been able to set those boundaries in different ways. So let me give you a couple of examples. Um, when your kids are little, uh, I don't know how many of you have kids yet or obviously are planning to have kids, but when your kids are little, whoever has to watch those kids, that is a tough job, right? That is a really tough job. And it is very hard for one person to kind of handle that job 18 or 19 hours a day. That's a, that's a hard thing. And so there, if, if, at that point in your life, it may be harder for you to work like crazy. And that's particularly hard because you're right at the start of your career generally when that kind of thing is going on. On the other hand, when your kids get a little older, maybe it becomes easier to actually have them around because you can yell at them or ground them or whatever you need to do to get them to behave. But the problem is that they probably need you more than, <laughs> than they did when they, were, when they were little. And so you have that challenge again. And I have had the opportunity of working with people who I'm very thankful for, who said that this was a time in their life when they were working seven days a week, 24 hours a day, and they absolutely killed it. 
Uh, and I'm appreciative that they did that. I've never been in a position where I felt like that was the right trade-off for me. But I have in my life had times when either my parents were sick, or we had issues with our kids, or for whatever reason, I had to have a different allocation of my time than would have been the best thing for my career. And the reason why it's important to decide what your boundaries are is because no one will decide it for you. Nobody's gonna decide that for you. It's a personal decision you have to make. And here's what could be really sad. If at the end of your career you look back and you got something other than what you intended, just decide to get whatever you intend. So if you say, look, I am gonna, this for me, I'm gonna create generational wealth, I'm gonna work like crazy, I'm gonna, that's, that's my objective. I wanna, I wanna give to charity and so I wanna earn a vast sum of money and I'm gonna work to make that happen. Uh, knock yourself out. Or you can say, look, the important thing for me is I want my kids to know that I was there for every football game and softball game and I coached when they were little. Knock yourself out, but get the choice that you want. Make a decision. Don't let somebody else make the decision for you, because they will. The decision they will make for you is to have you work all the time. Make a decision yourself about what you want, but make sure that you are doing what you are true in your heart of hearts what your heart of hearts tells you is the thing you want to personally accomplish. Because I think the saddest outcomes are where people have ended up with one thing and it was fundamentally different than the thing that they intended to have when they started that whole process along. It ain't an easy effort to figure this, this one out, but it's an important one to, to think about. Um, you know, I, I, I sit down with people all the time. I, I was talking to a fellow last night that has and an offer, someone I had known from when we lived in the New York area, and he has an offer from two different investment banks and he's trying to decide which one he wants to take. And he was talking about which one offered the better quality of life. And, and I, I, I laughed a little bit and he said, what's so funny? And I said, well, you're talking about horrible or awful. Those are the, <laughs> those are the differences, right? Those are the differences between horrible and awful. And you have to decide whether that horrible and awful is what you, what you want to do. Uh, but I do believe that it's possible to put your, put your foot on the pedal at different times and take it off at different times and manage your career like that. But just know that, that there's, a, there's a work cost that comes associated with that. But the benefit you get because you spend extra time with your mom and dad when they were ill, or the benefit you get it means more to you than it does to have had that last ball hit out of the park, if you know what I mean in terms of that uh, decision. So I think we're doing okay. I'm gonna try and save the last 10 minutes or so here for, uh, for Q&A. So uh, fourth decision, and this one is also gonna seem a little funny. So fourth decision is decide to exercise. <laughs> so uh, when I first joined Bain, I had a wonderful uh, guy that I worked for uh, who will remain nameless. Uh, and uh, he, I really, I learned a lot from him. He was a very funny guy. He was like two years my senior. He'd already become, no, he was like four years my senior. He'd already become a partner at Bain. And when you were a partner at Bain, you know, it was like we worshiped you. You know, we'd walk by and say, oh my gosh, he is a partner at Bain. And a uh, really good guy. And I, so I went in for my first performance review. And, uh, and he, uh, he was going through my review and telling me how I was doing on my various projects and all that kind of thing. And uh, you need to have a little background to know exactly how this performance review played out. So we didn't have a lot of money when we graduated from graduate school. And, uh, and so suddenly I'm doing a lot of trips for Bain, which at the time seemed like a lot of fun. By the way, it's, that's changed a lot over the last four years. Uh, the last thing I want to do now, but, uh, but that seemed like a lot of fun. And I'd go to different places, and the crazy thing is they actually paid for my food while I was on the road. And so, I would go to places and I'd order a steak and top it off with a milkshake and a big, you know, some kind of big dessert at the end. And I'd get up in the morning to have breakfast and I'd order, you know, the all-American breakfast, you know, that had like, you know, 3,000 calories in it. And, uh, and it wasn't long, first six or seven months, that I realized I had grown quite prosperous <laughs> in, that, in that role. And, uh, and so, anyway, so I go in to do this performance review and, and he tells me that I am slovenly, right? That I need to, I need to, to sharpen up, uh, basically. If somebody did that in performance review in one of my companies today, I'd make sure that they got fired. So I'd never put up with that. But at the time, it was a more kind of acceptable kind of thing. So anyway, they, 
so he gave me this coaching and he also told me that I shouldn't wear yellow shirts anymore, so, which com has completely intimidated me the rest of my life. I've never <laughs> worn a yellow dress shirt. It's kind of a couple of odd things. So anyway, so I went home and uh, I, I, I hadn't been on the scales for a long time and I, I got on the scales in my bathroom and my wife was standing right here next to me and I said, I can't imagine that it's that bad. And she poked me in the stomach and she said, oh yes, it's that bad, <laughs> it's that bad. And so anyway, that started uh, sort of a romance that I've had with the world of running, which started sort of right after that. I went out the next day and laced on a pair of running shoes and the first time out, I could hardly make it around a four block area around the house without dying. I ran all week that week and I had shin splints so bad I could hardly walk. And so I had to, I had to stop for a week to let the shin splints recover. But I would say most every day, with the exception of Sundays, most every day uh, since that happened, and that was, uh, I don't know, uh, probably 37 or 38 years ago now, most every day I've, I've gotten up in the morning and as part of a regular routine, I get some sort of uh, exercise. And, and it, I think, has been an enormous benefit to me professionally to have the feeling that comes with having your body feel healthy and strong and able to do the things that you want to have it do because you're under such incredible demands in your work. I'll give you one uh, example of this that I think will, will uh, help illustrate a little bit. So we lived in New Canaan, Connecticut for quite a while when we lived in New York. And uh, uh, I used to go out and run in the morning, but I had to be, American Express is an early starting company. And I had to be there at about 7.30 in the morning. And those of you who know that area know that New Canaan, Connecticut is an hour and 15 minutes from New York by car. And so I had to leave my house no later than 6.15 in order to get downtown by 7.30. And, uh, and so in order to exercise and do the other things I wanted to do, I had to get up every day at 4.45, which I did for many, 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 many years. And, uh, and it was a really painful, it was a painful life. Let me just say that. Uh, but one morning, so it was often dark, right? It was only light for a short part of the year. Most of the time when I would go out for a run, it was dark. And this is in these little Connecticut towns that have no uh, street lights or anything like that. So you're, I was either running by the power of a little light that I would wear on my forehead, which looked pretty goofy, I have to admit, or by, you know, somebody might have left a light on on their porch or something like that. And oftentimes I would run there was a yellow line in the middle of the road and I would just run, I, would, I could just see it right in front of me and so I would run on this yellow line to try and stay on it. But I had run this same pathway hundreds of times. And so this particular morning, I was up, I was out at five o'clock, I had looked outside and it looked really dark, but I thought, well, it's not that bad. And so I'd actually left my light at home because I hated to wear it. And so I went out, and, but I got outside and I realized, wow, it really is dark out here today. So I ran down the, down the hill, and then there was another road I'd run this way, and then up another hill, and then down, and then down to our house. And I'm running down to our house, and, uh, and I think all of you will relate to this. There are some times when you just feel like you're out exercising, and it just feels great. There's a lot of times when it feels awful, but there's, you know, half the time you're doing it, and you're saying, wow, this just feels great. And that was one of those days where I was feeling great. And I was, pick, I was picking up my pace and I was probably 30 or 40 yards up on the hill above where you, our driveway was. And I ran head on into a woman who was running exactly on the same spot going the other way. <laughs> and she of course screams, right? She thinks I'm an attacker. And I said, no, no, I live right here, I promise. I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And uh, she didn't stay around for any conversation, let me tell you. <laughs> she, took, she took off up the hill. And uh, I, of course, went in the driveway. And you know, the funny thing is, as you know, any of you who have sort of a routine know that you'll see the same people in the same place lots of times. And I didn't ever see her. Like, weeks go by, and I didn't ever see her. And I thought, wow, this is the craziest thing. So finally, about seven or eight months later, I'm running, and I see a woman running on the same road who I think might be the person that I ran into. And I said to her, are and she said, yeah, I was the one. <laughs> and it turns out she was the daughter of somebody who lived kind of close where we were and was only there occasionally. So uh, she happened to be out on the line just like I was on that particular day. But, the, but the, the key point is that you've been blessed with this incredible capability. And particularly at your age, you, you would not believe how capable you are relative to what you're going to be when you get to be my age. And just take advantage of it. Take advantage of your strength, your capabilities, stay strong and healthy, 
and get the exercise that your body needs so that you can reach the full potential of what you possibly can do. Now, sickness can obviously interfere with that. We don't have any control over how that all works. But even if you have the tragedy of sickness that comes into your life, you meet that tragedy better if you're personally able and have the strength yourself to try and make all that fit together. So final one uh, here, final decision, uh, and final point before we have question and answers for a few minutes. So the final point is to uh, settle on what is most important to you in your job now. Settle because that will determine how you interact with people and what you do. And uh, I, I think the best, I was thinking about this obviously earlier this week, knowing I was going to speak here, and trying to think what circumstance in my career captured this particular thought better than any that I had experienced. And uh, American Express uh, used to, I don't know if they still do that, but used to have an annual ski event for the CEOs of, the major, of their major customers. So if you had an American Express corporate card, uh, you were invited to come and, and be part of this uh, ski event. And the people who came were always you know, really uh, well-known, uh, great folks. And part of the event was they would get speakers to come in who were incredible folks who would give talks on various topics that would be of interest to the group of people that were there. And there would also be a part of the day where people would go skiing and that kind of thing. And, uh, and one year, uh, one of the speakers that spoke was a guy named uh, General Wesley, uh, General, uh, Wesley Clark. Uh, I don't know if that name means anything. Does that name mean anything to any of you? He actually ran for the Democratic nomination for president like eight years ago, something like that. But, uh, and, and I was asked to do an introduction for him uh, to, to come up. And I was supposed to come down and meet him and his wife ahead of time before that. And the guy's, the guy's title before he retired from the uh, military was the uh, supreme allied commander of all NATO forces in Europe. So that's a pretty good title, <laughs> supreme allied commander. And so I joked with him a little bit. I said, so after you've had that title, like, what's the next job? Turns out, I guess it might have been President of the United States, but anyway, what's the next job? So when I stood up to introduce him, uh, you know, he was such a, he, so he was sort of in charge of the Bosnian War, and that probably is something that's not in your memory banks, but it certainly is in the memory banks of everybody that's my age. It was a tragic war in which the United States really did yeoman's work to substantially improve the lives of many people. And uh, General uh, Clark was really the primary driving force behind both the help of those people and the success of our, of our troops in making that whole thing happen. But he's just an absolutely spectacular guy. So anyway, I stand up to introduce him, and I decide as part of the introduction to say what I just said is, I don't know what else you can be after you become the senior allied commander of NATO forces in Europe. That's a pretty important role. So he, anyway, he stands up. And he says, I've got to tell you, I said, now that Gary said that, I've got to tell you just how important my job really was. He said, uh, since I had become a general officer in the military, I had never had the, uh, the need or opportunity to actually drive my own car. Because there was always a, a staff person, either a, a, you know, a man or a woman, who would pick us up and take us wherever we needed to go. So if I was going to fly you know, to some place, the, the guy would come and pick me up in the car, and he'd take me over to a helicopter, and the helicopter would whisk me over to a, to a military plane, and the military plane would take me wherever I was going to go. Or if my wife and I were going to go to the grocery store, the staff person would come up with the car and pick us up, and we'd get in the back of the car, and he'd drive us to the PX, and we'd shop at the PX and get what we needed and go. If we wanted to go to the movie, movie theater, the same person would show up, take us to the movie theater. I just have never driven a car for all of these years. And he said, as I announced my retirement, uh, the people at the Pentagon were kind enough to offer to have a little bit of a retirement ceremony for me, he said, which I really appreciated. And he said it was an amazing event. They had you know, troops that were out on march on the parade on the field. And there were planes that flew over and dipped their wings you know, in honor of, uh, of his retirement and that kind of thing. And everybody was there. He said it was the greatest thing. So many people were there that I'd worked with throughout my entire career that I just felt so great about being there. And he said, so I shook every single last hand. We stayed there together, just the two of us. We, we you know, shook every hand until every last person was gone. And then I think to myself, oh, I've got to drive myself. So he said, I, I, you know, I reached down, do I have my keys? And I reached down, and sure enough, I had my keys in my pocket. 
uh, the guy had given them to me, and I go around the back of the, the back of the stadium, I guess, and there in the parking lot is my car. So I help my wife get in, and I go around to the other side, and I get in and start it up and start driving down the road, driving Miss Daisy. And he said, it occurred to me as I did that, that everything that I had had up to that point that were kind of the physical aspects of my job were gone. I, was, I didn't have any helicopters. I didn't have any military planes flying me anywhere. I didn't have any soldiers standing at attention to help me go to the PX anymore. That the only thing I had left was the wonderful relationships that I had with the men and women that I had been blessed to work with over all these years and the relationship I had with the woman sitting next to me in this car and the kids that had often occupied the back seats of our car at an earlier stage in my career. And he said, so turns out all that doesn't matter. None of that matters. What matters is the people that I know, the relationships that I had, and the memories of all those years. And uh, I guess that the final point related to this <coughs> final decision about deciding what's important to you now is that it turns out that what you're doing right here starts that whole process. So if you look around this room, I don't know who it is, but in this room are going to be some people that have very important jobs. Uh, it doesn't mean they'll make a lot of money. It means they'll have important jobs. Uh, I went to uh, Harvard with somebody that ended up being the Secretary of Labor. I don't know how much money you make when you're Secretary of Labor. That's a pretty important job to be the Secretary of Labor. And, but we'll have jobs that are very important. And we'll have, they'll have an opportunity to say, oh yeah, I knew Sally when I was at UVU. You know, I, I don't know. I, I don't know if I would hire Sally. Or I knew Bob. He was just incredible. What a guy, you know. He was always there. Whenever we had kind of group study, he was always willing to pitch in. And you would be surprised at how much the experience you're having right now colors the opportunity, both positively or negatively, that you're going to have way down the road. Because you simply don't know what people are going to be doing. All of us who have done for a while, we're going to be done. We're going to all be dead and gone. Nobody will ever think of us or mention our names anymore. And it'll just be you. And it will be you as you have built a reputation of integrity and support and becoming a good colleague over time. And uh, so my suggestion is be a good colleague. So that when you finish the course, when you're on the back of the stadium, when it's just you and your spouse, and you're on the back side of the stadium, you can say, it doesn't matter if all those trappings are gone because the things that are really important are all here. I, I still have all of that. I didn't lose any of those uh, capabilities. So anyway, as I said, those are five decisions. They ended up being five important ones for me. Uh, they may or may not be five important ones for you, but uh, uh, I hope it's a little bit uh, helpful with your thinking. So I think we have five minutes, right?